I'm uh, the first talk uh, comes from the University of Delaware, so Professor Mariante Gerard uh, Petitou. This, uh, this forum is uh, well known, uh, just um, a small introduction. She's the Boban Jane Gore Centennial Chair Professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. Uh, she did her bachelor at the National Technical University in Athens, PhD from Imperial College, and also from uh, uh, Princeton. So uh, today she's been talking about uh, Advancing sustainable circular economy through processes and engineering approaches. So, this is the first one. Okay. Hey, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction and uh, thank you all for being uh, here this morning with this uh, beautiful, with the sun is out, so uh, I hope that people will stay in with this, such a beautiful weather and scenery outside. Um, so I would really like to uh, start us off in this, uh, uh, in this uh, session about uh, sustainability, although we've heard a number of different uh, talks even yesterday that touch upon issues related to sustainability. Uh, as you see, I try to uh, reflect a little bit what the process systems engineering people uh, can contribute to this uh, very rich uh, area. Uh, and uh, hopefully by the end of uh, this session we will have a nice discussion uh, regarding all of those issues. Uh, so first of all for the people in the audience that they don't know the United States, where I'm coming off, uh, you know, this is the map of the United States and uh, if you see a little bit on the right hand side you will see a very small state called the state of Delaware. That's where the University of Delaware is. Uh, it's a beautiful campus. You see some nice uh, beautiful trees as your uh, area here. And just a little bit of advertisement from our uh, university and uh, department we are ranking in terms of graduate programs uh, seventh in the United States according to US News and in terms of other graduates we are ranked uh, uh, number five. So for the students in the audience that would like to continue their uh, studies, uh, please uh, come to our uh, department. Um, so in terms of like the, uh, my group at the uh, University of Delaware, actually the previous uh, PSC State of the Art uh, in Mexico uh, was uh, still at Rutgers University. So before joining uh, uh, Delaware, I spent like 21 years at Rutgers University. So new the department, new university, new uh, students. Uh, and I'd like to show them first because those are the people that are doing the work that I'm going to present today and I'm thankful to all of them of being in my, uh, in my lab. Uh, and before we're going to actually discussion and for the uh, people that are in the room that they don't uh, know my, my work, I'm working of course in process systems engineering for quite some time now, as I said, 21 years at Rutgers, 5 years already at the University of Delaware. Uh, and uh, ChatGPT actually uh, thought that Pro Optima is a nice name for the group. <laughs> <laughs> Process Optimization Modeling and Analysis Laboratory. Uh, so the work that we are doing is of course focusing on developing the tools, uh, uh, modeling tools for complex systems as you see in the circle in the middle. Uh, and with application area. So as I said to my uh, students, we're not doing development for the sake of development, but to be able to solve interesting problems. And the problems comes from on the uh, right hand side uh, in terms of like environmental uh, problems, sustainability. And of course, I mean, part of the sustainability problems, as you will see from my talk today, is also to be able to handle the supply chain issues uh, related to a number of different uh, components. And on the left hand side, I have done a lot of work in the area of pharmaceutical manufacturing. I'm not going to talk to you today uh, about this work, but if you are interested, I will be happy to chat uh, and chat with you both in terms of like solid-based uh, drugs, like tablet, tablets or capsules, but also recently in the area of biologic drug manufacturing, especially monoclonal antibodies. Uh, so, uh, for today, the problem is uh, the, the, that we're discussing is uh, with regard to sustainability. 
right? So, and uh, I think a number of speakers yesterday actually pointed into the fact that uh, we have this uh, Paris Agreement uh, Treaty and everybody, at least in the scientific community, agree that we need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in order to be able to keep uh, the temperature of the planet at uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, and I think Colin Gonzalo is also showing those, uh, those numbers. So we need 45% reduction in order to achieve by 2030 to keep warming less than 1.5 degrees Celsius. So that has been increased at least awareness in terms of like the uh, people, the customer awareness, but also in terms of like uh, uh, different governments around the world. And uh, what I'm showing here is basically the strategy that can lead to this uh, target by the, uh, by the uh, 2030. Uh, also, a number of chemical companies have come on board and they say that, uh, yes, we have to uh, be able to achieve certain targets by certain, uh, uh, by specific date. And uh, you cannot see all, uh, all of the numbers in the table, but uh, there are a number of different chemical companies, petrochemical companies, like uh, DuPont, Gemours, and so on, but also companies from here, from China, that actually has uh, put in their strategic plans targets related to reducing the uh, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in order to achieve though, these targets, uh, we, it's not uh, possible to target only energy resources. Uh, by target energy resources, you can achieve up to 55%. The rest has to come out of replacing the chemicals and how we're producing the different chemicals. So the, there is a growing interest uh, in the last at least 10-15 uh, uh, years to use different resources to produce uh, chemicals. And biomass is one of those because we can find biomass, again if we were uh, certain uh, speakers yesterday alluded to that, we can find biomass in residues that are, uh, exist uh, after you get uh, the resources from the crops. And uh, then you can get to this biomass, you can uh, uh, decompose the biomass into different uh, uh, components and then starting building, uh, get, getting the building blocks and then starting uh, producing the secondary chemicals which can be used then to produce uh, the products. So moving downstream, you see that uh, first we have to do the decomposition and then again we need to add the complexity to build the products that we would like to uh, build. And uh, the Department of Energy in the US has uh, provided at least 12 uh, chemicals which belong to this category. Are they call platform chemicals because from those chemicals, if you produce those from biomass, then you can, uh, those can lead to a number of different uh, in, uh, products that we're using in everyday life. Another uh, thing that I think that we haven't uh, yet discussed, but I have the feeling that today we're going to discuss it uh, a lot, is the uh, concept of circularity. Right? So uh, it's uh, the way that we are operating as a society currently, it's the linear way. We're getting, we're using, we're throwing out. Right? So the idea here for the circularity is that we need to stop uh, uh, acting in that linear way, but you reduce, uh, uh, moving towards the circular economy, which basically operates under three different concepts. The three concepts for circularity are the following. First, I mean, we have to uh, reduce the waste. So we have to design the processes to reduce waste. Second, we need to keep products in the economy. So stop using and throw it away. Keep the, the products into the economy. And the third concept is basically regenerate the natural sources. Right? So those are the three concepts of circular economy that uh, we have to have in mind in order to reach this, uh, um, this circular economy. I'm going to talk to you, to you today about those two things, right? Biomass to chemicals and waste to 
uh, uh, interesting uh, mechanics, right? So as we will be able to close uh, the, 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 the circle, right? So there are challenges, and uh, you know, I, I, I think I like what uh, I think Gonzalo or Mariano pointed out. Where there are challenges, there are opportunities, right? So we can see the challenges as opportunities, especially in this uh, community, to work and resolve with these uh, challenges. So in terms of the challenges to address those problems, first of all, you know, we are all, uh, you know, I, I, I think most of us in, uh, in this room have been called to, to do techno-economic analysis and life cycle assessment, right? So everybody nowadays, especially in the US when you're writing a proposal to the Department of Energy, you need to have techno-economic analysis and life cycle assessment experts, right? But those, those analysis is good, as good as the experimental data that you have available. Right? So if you don't have the data available, or you cannot make good predictions of the properties of the chemicals that are going through your analysis, then garbage in, garbage out. Right? So we don't, the, the, there is a big you know, elephant in the room, which is the data. Right? So let's not forget that. Then it's the complexity of the model, which we are able to handle somehow, because we have worked on those complex problems before, right? So we can actually put together, you know, complex feedstocks, we can uh, do the flow sheet diagrams, we can uh, evaluate uh, the performance of processes based on the different uh, performance criteria, right? And, uh, of course, I mean, the other challenge uh, that uh, is coming at the end is uh, the complexity of the overall picture because, as I'm going to show you in some of the examples that I'm going to present, things are changing depending on the boundary that you are including. Not only in the life cycle assessment, but in the problem in general. If you include issues related to supply chain, the discussion is different than if you don't include the supply chain issues, right? So there are, you know, the uh, complexity that arises uh, uh, um, from the system boundary that you are uh, considering, and of course, I mean, we as a process systems engineering community, we can address those issues with modeling, optimization, and uncertainty mm -hmm. analysis. So what I'm going to uh, discuss with you today are a few uh, examples that we have uh, established collaborations with experimental groups in order to be able to do some uh, reasonable uh, analysis. And as you see here, I mean, the, the biomass, uh, uh, regarding biomass, consists of three different uh, uh, components, if you like, right? So, thermal cellulose, the cellulose, and the lignin. And uh, you, the first step in utilizing biomass is basically to break, to break uh, biomass in those components and then starting uh, the decomposition uh, from there or from here in cellulose we have the C5s, for cellulose we have the C6, the sugars, right? And then the sugars can be transformed to platform chemicals and then from platform chemicals we can do further uh, chemistry in order to go to products that we can utilize to polymerize and have like, uh, for example, plastics. But what I would like to bring into the picture is that you have to be able to explore all the different components of biomass to make it economically viable. So lignin, for example, was the component that was not been examined before, but nowadays, the last five years, a lot of it, uh, interest in lignin and how we can utilize the component of lignin to uh, uh, increase the economic viability of uh, the biomass uh, to chemicals. Uh, I'm not going to talk to you about the anaerobic uh, digestion because there is not enough time, but I'm going to talk about the waste blast uh, conversion. We're going to bring some integrated flow sheets and hopefully we'll have time to discuss some optimization. So let's go for the first, right? The, the first uh, components that I discussed with you, which is basically the, uh, human, uh, the cellulose to, be, to produce uh, uh, hydroxymethyl furfural, which is one of the main, the first uh, intermediates to produce the final chem chemical. And um, 
I would like to bring into the picture different, uh, uh, specific characteristics of this reaction which we can explore in order to increase the efficiency of the process. The first thing is that when we first uh, uh, work with the group of Professor Dion Vlachos at the University of Delaware, the yield that we can achieve was about 50%. Single phase reactor. Why? Because the HMF then decomposes to other, there are other, by uh, uh, different rea reactions that are happening, so we're losing the HMF that we're producing. So what is the solution to the pro this problem? By phasic reaction. So we have an organic phase, so uh, then you can extract basically simultaneously the HMF to the organic phase and increase the reaction yield to the right hand side, right? So basic chemical engineering, the yield has been increased to 75%. Another thing that you can do in terms of process intensification, instead of like uh, uh, having these big reactors where the heat and mass balances are very uh, difficult to achieve, then you're moving to the smaller reactors where the heat and mass balances are much uh, easier and then you have an extra <coughs> increasing yield to approximately 90%. If you like, if you are adventurous, if you like to go a step further, then you can look at the separation processes. And instead of using extraction and evaporation based separation, then you go to the absorption based uh, extraction from water and you have an extra uh, uh, increase in terms of the efficiency. Right? Now that you have all the whole picture, then you can go and perform the flow sheet simulation and perform the techno-economic analysis and life cycle assessment. There is a catch, of course, because now we're using a micro-reactor. So you cannot go to Aspen and ask to produce the micro-reactor. So the, uh, the uh, excellent postdoc that came to my group from Mariano's uh, group, uh, uh, Hernandez Borja, actually did this uh, very nice uh, scheme where basically looked at uh, is uh, uh, modeling the bio the, the reactor outside Aspen and then have a way of iteratively going back and forth between the simulation and the, uh, the calculation that was doing in terms of the reactor and uh, then at the end we have the convergence. Also what you see here is an alternative separation scheme which is basically the absorption that I, I told you before. And after you've done all of this, then you can move to the techno-economics. Of course, we all know that most of the times when we're doing economic analysis, we're looking at a minimum selling price of the product that you are producing. Here, we're producing the HMF. And what is showing here is basically how the economics change with respect to the pipe diameter of the reactor. Because, as I said, I mean, we move to the micro-reactors. And what you see is that the yellow is basically the micro-scale, and the, the, the green-blue is basically the macro-scale. So, of course, I mean, you know, the economics, I have uh, already uh, described why we have, uh, you have better economics when you are moving to the micro-scale. Micro well, of course, I mean, you know, looked also at the effects of the, in the minimum uh, selling price and the effects of uh, uh, if you are considering the biphasic reaction or a single phase reaction or if you are considering the adsorption. And in all cases, the adsorption was a better separation, uh, separation process. Uh, in terms of the global warming uh, potential, uh, we have looked at uh, kilograms of CO2, the equivalent of CO2 for the kilograms of uh, HMF production, and you see that you can achieve some reduction in terms of the CO2 emissions, approximately 5%. The most uh, uh, advantage that we see with this system was basically the economics. Uh, now I'm going to move a little bit uh, one step further, right? So you're producing uh, HMF, now you're moving from HMF to DMF with the extra uh, uh, reaction of hydrogenation. And what I'm illustrating in this uh, graph is basically the, uh, we have heard a lot about Bayesian optimization. So of course, now that we have the experimental uh, uh, data available, we utilize also the, uh, the Bayesian optimization. And the optimization variables in this case was basically different operating conditions like temperature, the water content, the HMF load, how you are starting your reactions 
the reaction time, the pressure of uh, hydrogen. And what we uh, noticed was basically here I'm showing how the uh, Bayesian optimization works. So on the x-axis you see the number of experiments, the optimization trials, and how you are converging to the conditions that I highlighted on the top, high temperature, high pressure, no water if possible, and medium, medium HMF load in order to achieve the optimal, uh, optimal minimum selling price for this, uh, uh, for this problem. Moving on, because there are a lot of different components, as I said, I mean, we have worked uh, with a different group at the uh, University of Delaware, the group of Professor uh, Thomas Epps, and there is, of course, uh, we have uh, published this work that we looked at basically how now you can decompose lignin, uh, and we have used the reductive catalytic deconstruction method first in batch mode, and we compare now the batch mode with the continuous intensified process. And uh, what we notice is that uh, basically we're moving from batch to continuous process, you are achieving uh, better performance and uh, in terms of uh, the, the conversion, but also in terms of the conditions. And as you notice maybe from the, the graph here, in, for the batch process we're using a different solvent than from the uh, a continuous process. Just highlighting some results, again here with the contribution of the different components in terms of the minimum selling price. And uh, what uh, I have pointed here is the reduced capital cost in terms of the continuous uh, process operation and uh, the fact that we're uh, producing the extra revenue based on the co-product uh, production. Um, so, I uh, have a lot of things to cover, so I'm going to switch gears to the waste plastics uh, upside, upside in to produce valuable products. So, we're talking about this part here and why were we working on this problem? Because as we all know, right, I mean, we're producing a lot of plastics. So, we're producing around 350 million tons of plastics a year. 75% uh, of those plastics end up in the landfill. So that's not sustainable. We don't have to be an expert in the field to understand that it's not sustainable. So what we, what the work that we are doing is basically working with a number of different uh, uh, colleagues, and actually this is also work that uh, uh, Borja Hernandez has done in my group in collaboration with Professor Lacus Group that we looked at different thermochemical uh, uh, processes, pyrolysis, gasification, hydrocracking, hydrothermal liquefaction, hydrogenolysis, as alternatives uh, to, pro to take the plastics and produce certain uh, products, like uh, lubricants, hydrogen, uh, fuels, and uh, we, uh, we looked at uh, basically the pros and cons of different technologies, conventional technologies, break the plastic using heat. Other technologies like hydrocracking and hydrogenolysis, they, use the, they break the plastic because you have to break the polymer, right, uh, to produce the uh, building blocks that we can use then to produce other chemicals. We use the lower temperature but use hydrogen to break the, the, uh, the, the plastic. So, uh, with all of those technologies, uh, again, uh, Borja went into the uh, Aspen uh, plus simulator. We're using different uh, uh, components in terms of like the different uh, uh, units, the reaction, the... <laughs> Five minutes. No way. <laughs> I bargained. <laughs> okay. uh, so maybe I'll go a little bit uh, faster in terms of this to go to the next. Uh, so you know, uh, what I'm showing here is basically a flow sheet model in Aspen that we're using to uh, be able then to do techno-economic analysis. So let me show you some of the results here in terms of comparing the different processes. Pyrolysis was the most profitable one. And what I'd like to bring into the picture is the fact that collection and sorting of plastics is a major component of the cost, right? Something that we have to have in mind, that it's not only the process, it's basically where we're finding the plastic, how we are sorting it, how we are then utilizing it. In terms of global warming potential, and as you see here, I'm using the, um, uh, the unit uh, that uh, 
I'm working on is basically going into the uh, raw material rather than into the product in order to have a one-to-one -on -one comparison. And you see that between like the, the pyrolysis and hydrogenolysis, because we are having the same products, uh, the, um, the uh, hydrogenolysis is better than pyrolysis, and for the other uh, uh, for the other technologies, hydrocracking was better than liquefaction. So, uh, if we are moving now towards integrated process, I'm going to show you only one of those. The one that basically goes from the lignin first, and then exploits all the different components. So instead of doing only one uh, production, one chemical, you have to take lignin, you have to take the uh, lignocellulose, cellulose, and produce the, the, uh, the chemicals. And actually, we looked back into the biomass. So, and we looked at where this biomass is coming from. So, as you see from the figure on the right, you see that the twigs and the branches of the tree are actually better feedstock than the bark or the mixed leaves and so on. So we had a collaboration, very interesting collaboration with our colleagues that actually looking at the trees to find out what is the best raw material. I'm going to skip this because we don't have time and go maybe into the optimization, just one optimization case study and I'm going to uh, stop. Um, because I think that, you know, the, uh, putting everything together and uh, working on a superstructure optimization is our bread and butter. So this is uh, much easier for us to understand. Uh, but I like to highlight here a, a problem that we also pointed out yesterday, right? Uncertainty. Uncertainty in the prices, uncertainty in the feedstock and supply, and uncertainty in terms of both the conversion that goes into the reaction and the LCA data that we're using, right? So my student that is actually going to graduate on, uh, on Friday, and that's why I'm leaving tomorrow, is basically looked at incorporating uh, the, uh, not only the stochastic programming, but actually a level of flexibility. And I could not go in any talk without showing some artificial neural network results, right? So what uh, he has done is basically take the flexibility index and uh, produce a, uh, a, and uh, approximate the flexibility index using an artificial neural network and use this rectified linear unit for the activation factor in order to keep the problem linear. So I thought that that was very, uh, a very smart uh, way of basically incorporating also the flexibility into the results and approximating now the profit, uh, global warming potential and flexibility as a tri-objective optimization to solve this problem. I'm going to finish with only this, right? So profit, global warming potential, flexibility, the three objectives. And what you see is that you are paying a price to increase flexibility. So moving from the red line to the blue line in order to increase the flexibility, that means in terms of uh, uh, the design that we are building an extra capacity to improve the flexibility. That means that uh, you have a slight increase for each capacity, new technologies in order to provide higher flexibility. Okay, so I don't have time to do the supply chain, uh, uh, so you have to trust me that we have done the supply chain for this problem. Um, summarizing, I'd like to leave you with uh, some notes. You know, we have, uh, we have as a community to go into these problems with uh, uh, very careful steps in order to be able to utilize data that can be verifiable and, uh, uh, and uh, utilize that in, uh, carefully. I'd like to acknowledge uh, financial support for the work that we're doing, but most of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for their kind uh, invitation, for their persistence to hold this meeting after, uh, the, uh, after um, COVID and, uh, of course, in the uh, University for uh, hosting us here. Thank you so much and sorry for running a little late.